Welcome to this second in my lecture series on England's reformations and their legacies. The idea of the series is that an event as complicated and as contentious as the English Reformation can't be reduced to a single master narrative. Instead, what I'm aiming to do is to show it to you from six different perspectives, six different accounts of how the story played out. All of them are, I hope, truthful, or at least factually accurate. Which one you or I might think is the most truthful is a question for another day. Today's story, though, is one of the bleaker versions of events, England's unwanted reformation. We might even use the coin, that, the term that was coined for it at the time. In some countries, the Protestant Reformation was a mass movement. Protestantism in much of Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, Scotland, as you can see here, even France. In these countries, the Protestant Reformation may not have been popular, and everywhere a great many people loathed the new religion, but it was a mass movement. Townspeople, aristocrats, sometimes even peasants, mobilized to create new religious worlds in the teeth of opposition from their rulers. But in a few territories, the story was reversed. In Sweden, in some German territories, in Ireland and in England, the initiative came from the top. Populations that had shown at best little interest in religious innovations were suddenly compelled to embrace them. The tale of how England's Protestant Reformation was rammed down the country's unwilling throat isn't the whole truth, but it's a part of the truth which most English people have been too ready to forget, except, that is, for England's persistent Catholic minority who've made that narrative their own. We apparently owe the most compelling one-word summary of this story to a man named John Proctor. He was a schoolmaster who, like a great many others, found an unheroic but sincere path through the dangerous confusion of mid-16th century England. Proctor was born in 1521, so he was still only a boy when Henry VIII broke with Rome in 1534. From 1537 to 46, Proctor was a student at Oxford, the more traditionalist, religiously traditionalist of England's two universities. And at that time, he persuaded himself that the man whom he called that noble Henry, King of Kings, was simply stamping out superstition and abuses. He let himself go along with Henry VIII's Reformation. And once he left Oxford, he went to become a schoolmaster in Kent. But in 1547, the boy king Edward VI came to the throne and England's reformation entered a, a phase of accelerating radicalism. And Proctor watched this with dismay, trying to hold on to a disappearing religious center ground, holding on to the, the faith he had once expressed in Henry VIII's reformation, but watching it curdle. His nightmare lasted until 1553 when King Edward died and was succeeded by his elder sister, Mary, who set about returning her wayward subjects to Catholic obedience. A sorrier and wiser Proctor now celebrated the end of England's experiment with heresy and rude his own previous flirtation with it. The nation had learned the hard way, he wrote, that the Protestants offered not, as they made you believe, faithful religion, but deceitful delusion not truthful preaching, but ruthful breaking of all Christian orders, not right reformation of things amiss, but devilish deformation of things that were well. What he couldn't know was that within five years, both he and his queen would be dead, and that Catholic England's deformation had only just begun. The story of the English Deformation 
is one of religious change successfully imposed on an unwilling population. To modern sensibilities, reared as we are on the democratic notion that the will of the people ought naturally to prevail, this sounds as if it should have been impossible. But Tudor England was in no sense a democracy. The normal place of its common people was to endure and to obey. But very little about what happened to England's religious life in the 16th century was normal. As the time-honored rules of religious politics were torn up, the people who deplored what was happening sometimes simply acquiesced, but sometimes also held the changes at bay, negotiated with, or in some cases, openly resisted them. Occasionally, they even succeeded. And that's our story today. So let's begin in the late 1520s, as the people of England became aware that their king was proposing to throw over his long-standing, faithful, and pious wife, Queen Catherine, in favor of a scheming, younger, French-educated rival, and to declare his daughter a bastard in the process. Now, this proposal could be and was defended in terms of canon law or reason of state, but it could not really be defended in terms of common morality. You might say, who cares? Subjects' opinions about their monarch's marriages didn't usually matter very much. But once it became clear that Henry VIII was planning to throw out not just his lawful wife, but also the Vicar of Christ, the Pope, popular distaste acquired a harder edge. In 1532, an MP from Warwickshire, Sir George Throckmorton, accused the king to his face of having meddled with both Anne Boleyn's sister and also her mother, a double accusation so shocking that the king, caught off balance, effectively conceded the first part in his eagerness to deny the second. The fact that Throckmorton could get away with this kind of insolence shows how fragile politics had become. And he wasn't just speaking for himself. Throckmorton's warning, or perhaps threat, to the king was that if Henry persisted, such feuds and intestine divisions would result therefrom as to completely destroy and subvert the whole kingdom. This was not an idle threat. England had had dynastic civil wars within living memory. As Henry's battle with his wife turned into a wider war with the church, his subjects began to choose sides. It was all too obvious that many of the king's supporters at court were self-serving careerists, while most of his opponents were taking their stands on principle and had nothing to gain and everything to lose from doing so. The moral authority that they thereby acquired was considerable. John Fisher, the elderly, pious Bishop of Rochester, was England's most internationally eminent theologian. He also became Queen Catherine's earliest and most consistent defender. And as the stakes became plainer, other more politically cautious churchmen began to find their consciences too. Stephen Gardner, the young, ambitious Bishop of Winchester, derailed his own hitherto effortless political ascent in 1532 when he discovered that he could no longer bring himself to collaborate with his king's schemes. Even Archbishop William Wareham of Canterbury, a long-serving, generally rather pliable prelate, was finding it impossible to ignore his conscience. In early 1532, he prepared what would have been a blistering speech to be delivered in the House of Lords, citing Magna Carta and the ominous example of St. Thomas Becket to argue that the king must not trespass on the liberties of what he called Ecclesia Anglicana. He used the Latin so as to avoid uttering the phrase, the Church of England, words that Henry VIII was rapidly turning into a nationalistic totem. Bishop Fisher and Archbishop Wareham were both connected to a maybe more dangerous figure still. Elizabeth Barton, the Holy Maid of Kent, a servant girl turned nun, 
whose pious visions were acquiring a dangerously political edge. She claimed that God had told her that if the king remarried, he would forfeit his throne and be deposed within a month. For a brief moment, Barton looked like a new Joan of Arc, the peasant girl who a century before had helped to drive another English king from one of his thrones. The fact that these threats never came to a head was chiefly due to the man who, at that disastrous royal interview with George Throckmorton, intervened to limit the damage. Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's chief advisor and man of business by the 1520s, the, the strategic mastermind who pushed the royal supremacy through. He sidelined the conscience-stricken bishops, paralyzed as they were by their twin loyalties to God's church and to their anointed king. Wareham, Wareham wrote his blistering speech but never delivered it, and he had the decency to die in August 1532, just in time to be replaced at Canterbury by a surprise candidate. Thomas Cranmer was a young, relatively obscure scholar who'd become a confidant of the king's, and he was chosen for this dizzying promotion for one and only one reason. He genuinely supported the king's twin grievances with his wife and with the pope. There was no danger that his conscience might tug him in an inconvenient direction. Gardner and others were frozen out of favour until one by one they gave in and reconciled themselves to the new world. Only two prominent naysayers refused to buckle. Bishop Fisher and his friend Thomas More. The Pope tried to save Fisher by making him a cardinal, which enraged rather than deterred the king. More tried to save himself by shrewd legal tactics, which only compelled Cromwell to concoct evidence against him. By the time both men were beheaded in the summer of 1535, they were almost alone. The threat of popular resistance had already been headed off, at least temporarily. Elizabeth Barton may not have shared Joan of Arc's achievement, but she shared her fate. She and her supporters were rounded up in late 1533. She was forced publicly to denounce her own prophecies as having been faked and was then judicially murdered. In the meantime, Cromwell developed an unprecedented and in its own quiet way revolutionary policy. Every adult male in England was required by law to swear an oath recognizing the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn and also, by implication, his newly claimed supremacy over the English church. To refuse to swear was to invite a treason charge. The fact that virtually the entire nation complied demonstrates the regime's strength. The fact that the regime needed to extort such an oath demonstrates its weakness. Kings don't normally need their subjects' consent in order to marry. By requiring the entire population to an express an opinion on the subject, even if that opinion was prescribed for them, the regime had opened up undreamt of possibilities for political participation. This was the first time that the English population, or the English adult male population as a whole, had ever been formally drawn into politics. It's also a sign that Henry VIII's Reformation, as it was not yet called, would be more than a matter for lawyers and for bishops. Already it was reaching out into the parishes. Orders went out to ban the prayers for the Pope said at every Mass and to ensure that preachers extolled the title that the king had now claimed for himself of supreme head of the Church of England. As yet, these changes were, were clouds no bigger than a man's hand. Most parishes accommodated them with a few hand-inked corrections to their service books, but they were signs of what was to come. Thomas Cromwell was soon given the grand, new-minted title of the king's vicegerent in spirituals, which empowered him, even though he's a mere layman, not a priest, empowered him to exercise the king's supremacy over the church 
on his master's behalf. He had been a former man of business for Cardinal Wolsey, and he now quickly redoubled the reforming efforts he'd made on his old master's behalf. A steady flow of ominous initiatives poured out of the formidable bureaucratic machine that Cromwell was developing. His commissioners traveled the country reporting on the property and income of every parish in the church, and also searching with undisguised malice for reports of moral lapses in monastic houses. They don't seem to have concocted much evidence wholesale. That sort of crude tactic was limited to emergencies like the Thomas More situation. Cromwell's machine was perfectly capable of using ambiguous categories, such that, for example, a few reports from a monastery of what used to be called solitary vice could be legally classified as sodomy and used to tar the reputation of the entire house. As these sorts of defamatory reports circulated, in the summer of 1535, Henry VIII went on an extensive royal progress to the west of England, which helped to cool anxieties there. He was always superb at the theatrics of monarchy. But the north simmered. In the spring of 1536, Anne Boleyn, the new queen to whose legitimacy the entire nation had just sworn, was suddenly declared an adulterous, incestuous traitor. The marriage was declared to have been invalid from the beginning, and she was beheaded. What are people supposed to think? Rumors flew. A new set of royal injunctions that same year ordered that every church should keep a comprehensive register of all baptisms, marriages, and funerals. What did it mean? Were all the, those services now going to be taxed? How far could the king and the clique of heretics around him push their luck? As it turned out, the last straw was not a new policy, but one which looked back to Cardinal Wolsey in the previous decade, putting monasteries to better use. Wolsey had seized several carefully selected monastic houses for carefully pious purposes. But in his last year in power, he'd secured new authority to repurpose monastic property on a larger scale. Those powers had lapsed with his fall, from, his fall in 1529, 1530. But Parliament considered several other such schemes in the early 30s. I think it's likely that whoever had been in power in England in the 1530s would have ended up raiding the monastic estate. But as it happened, it was Thomas Cromwell, Wolsey's former enforcer, who did this, and he did it with verve, thoroughness, and a sharp eye. In the spring of 1536, he secured a blunt but effective piece of legislation. All religious houses with an annual income of less than 200 pounds would be dissolved, that is, closed down. The monks and nuns either released from their vows or transferred to other houses. The monastery's lands and goods would be placed in the care of the church's supreme head. The pretense that this was about reform rather than plunder was scarcely maintained. The commissioners who set out to enforce this policy in the autumn of 1536 touched a match to an already tinder-dry bonfire of popular grievance and suspicion, especially in the north of England, where parish churches were thinly scattered and monasteries and the services that they provided were integral to many lay Christians' lives. The revolts began in Lincolnshire, and they rapidly spread north. The biggest, the most dangerous rising centred in Yorkshire called itself the Pilgrimage of Grace for the Commonwealth. These pilgrims marched under a banner of Christ's wounds. This is one of the surviving ones. Ominously following the example the regime had set them, they bound themselves with a common oath. They declared their loyalty to the king, but they also declared that they were known in their conscience with spreading heresies, suppression of houses of religion, and other matters touching the commons' wealth. And indeed, the dissolution was at the center of their concerns. It was a disaster, they said, whereby the service of God is not only minished, but also the plurality of your realm be unrelieved. So spiritual and secular concerns are intertwined. 
But the rebels also bluntly demanded that the circle of heretics around the king must be driven out, that the bastardized Princess Mary should be restored to the line of succession, and at least some degree of the Pope's authority should be restored. Within weeks, there were 40,000 rebels in arms in the north, in alarmingly good order. And there were frightening whispers of sympathy in the south as well. London was abuzz with reports of the rebels' demands. The city authorities tried to impound weapons. The furious king scrambled together what forces he could, but it quickly became clear that if it came to a fight, he and his reformation could not win. It was a moment, maybe the moment, when popular will could conceivably have stopped the English Reformation. And it didn't happen. The king didn't win a battle, but he didn't need to. Instead, he outlasted and outmaneuvered his opponents. He lulled them into dispersing with empty promises. He found pretexts to abandon those promises as soon as it was safe to do so. He rounded up and slaughtered the ringleaders, and he imposed martial law on the north of England. So it was a turning point, but not the one the pilgrims had wanted. The king's opponents had shown their hand and lost. Who was going to stand in his way now? Cromwell, whose life had hung by a thread while the pilgrims' army was on the march, now redoubled his efforts. His reformation began to reach into parish life like it had never done before. In 1538, a systematic assault was made on shrines, relics, and sites of pilgrimage across the country. Once venerated objects were publicly ridiculed and then privately melted down, burned, or pulverized. A swathe of traditional saints' days and fasting days were banned, cowed, disorientated, concerned to save what fragments they could of their community's former property. Most parishes mutely complied. And by 1540, Cromwell had dissolved not only the smaller monasteries targeted in 1536, but every single religious house in England. It's the biggest transfer of landed wealth in English history. But in that same year, in 1540, Cromwell's luck finally ran out. A sudden, capricious surge of the king's rage cost him his head. There have been any number of explanations advanced for Cromwell's fall, ranging from the elaborate to the storybook simple. But whatever you make of the frantic political maneuvers of that spring and summer, the fundamental fact remains. Even the most skilled gambler who plays dice with the devil will sooner or later lose a hand. This is what tended to happen to people whom Henry VIII was intimate with. It's what had happened to Cardinal Wolsey and to Anne Boleyn before, and others, not least Archbishop Cranmer and the king's last wife, Catherine Parr, came within a whisker of the same fate. One thing that that perspective shows us is that Cromwell's fall from power didn't mean as much as it seemed to. Combined with a law passed the previous year in 1539, the so-called Act of Six Articles, which declared the king's loyalty to a set of traditional Catholic doctrines, that law plus Cromwell's death encouraged English Catholics to believe that the tide had turned and that the worst was over. But the execution of Cromwell was not a carefully considered change of direction. It was a spasm of homicidal paranoia. Henry VIII had come to enjoy his self-image as the purifier of the English church and the accompanying prophets. In 1541, a long-delayed royal progress to the north of England brought a shocked king face to face with the continued veneration of images and statues there and a fresh purge of idolatry followed. Archbishop Cranmer persuaded the king to introduce a new English language form for processional prayers in 1544. Those prayers did not, however, bring victory in the ruinously expensive wars with France and Scotland. And so in late 1545, a new law gave the king power to seize the endowments of chantries, colleges, and virtually any other church foundation he pleased. In 1546, he seriously considered systematically stripping the assets of England's two universities. 
before deciding in his capricious way that it tickled his fancy more to found an ostentatious new college at each of the two universities instead. By then, Henry VIII was already seriously ill. When he finally died in early 1547, his crown passed to his nine-year-old son here, doing his best to show that he's a chip off the old block. But the question was who would rule in the boy's name? And whether by chance or not, in the last two months of the old king's life, the murderous dance of court politics lurched decisively against the religious conservatives. When the music stopped, when the king died on the 27th of January, 1547, Bishop Gardner, the leading conservative churchman, was once again frozen out of favor. The Duke of Norfolk, the leading conservative nobleman, was only hours away from being beheaded. The king's death actually saved him. The new regime was a little less homicidal, although the six years in prison that he enjoyed instead permanently broke his health. In what amounted to an internal coup, the government of England was seized by a determined clique of Protestants, headed by the king's swashbuckling uncle, Edward Seymour, the brother of Henry VIII's third wife. Seymour became Duke of Somerset and Lord Protector. England has never been ruled by a government whose views are so sharply out of step with the country as a whole. There was more to the program which this government pushed insistently through over the next six years than simple destruction. Yet traditionalists could be forgiven for feeling that way. A new set of royal injunctions ordered every parish to take away, utterly extinct and destroy all shrines, coverings of shrines, pictures, paintings, and other monuments of feigned pilgrimages, miracles, idolatry, and superstition, so that there remain no memory of the same. Even before the injunctions were issued, it had begun. Protestant provocateurs were attacking images, rightly confident that no one was going to stop them. In November 1547, even the great rood, the crucifix in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, was desecrated. Printers began producing outspokenly evangelical works, viciously mocking pieties that had once been universally respected. No one was willing to print the books making the opposite case. If parish priests were inclined to argue, the regime suspended all preaching licenses until a new wave of preachers could be approved. And in the meantime, an official set of printed sermons were sent to every parish and reluctant priests ordered to read them aloud. The regime's determination to push through this agenda was sharpened by its desperate need for cash. Protector Somerset hurled himself into a fresh and ultimately doomed war with Scotland. In late 1547, the regime did what Henry VIII had threatened and dissolved all the chantries and collegiate churches. The universities alone were accepted. This second dissolution is now much less well known than the assault on the monasteries, but its impact was comparable. Another vast swathe of property passed into royal hands. These endowments had supported many thousands of priests, almost as many as held parish positions. They'd acted as teachers, as scriveners, or in other vital roles in local communities, and they're now pensioned off on a pittance. The prayers that they'd said and the sacraments that they'd celebrated on behalf of the deceased parents, grandparents, and children of the parishes simply stopped. The principal link between the worlds of the living and the dead that their work represented had been cut. And the ratchet of change only accelerated. In 1548, as the chantries and colleges were being shuttered, traditional liturgical practices like the use of holy water were banned. A new English language order for the mass, up till then always in Latin, was implemented. Senior clergy who objected were one by one deprived of office, imprisoned, or driven into exile, but not killed. That's a sign that this regime lacked both Henry VIII's self-confidence and also his vengefulness. 
In 1549, the most imposing physical monuments of the old religion, the roods and the consecrated stone altars, were destroyed. Every one of the 9,000 parish churches in medieval England and Wales will have had a rood loft, a life-sized carved crucifix atop the, atop the screen separating the chancel from the nave, the dying Christ flanked by equally life-sized figures of his mother and the apostle John. Not a single one of those medieval images now survives. This is a, a modern reconstruction. An ominously titled act of uniformity required that from the feast, feast of Pentecost in 1549, every parish should abandon its old liturgy in favour of a new English order of service to be the same everywhere with the forceful title, the Book of Common Prayer. Again, we might imagine there's only so much unwelcome radicalism that rulers can foist on their people before they push back. In the summer of 1549, a wave of unrest swept across much of England, stirred chiefly by economic woes. The population had been growing for decades, slowly pushing up rents, impoverishing peasants, enriching landowners. And that situation is now worsened by a surge of inflation as a cash-strapped government begins debasing the coinage to fund its wars. So in the summer of 1549, there's rioting, there's looting, there's attacks on landowners. There are encampments as alarmingly well-ordered troops of protesters assembled to petition their rulers for redress and make clear that they're not going home until they get, they get an answer that's satisfactory. Some of these protesters wrapped themselves in the banner of the old religion. In Hampshire and Sussex, there was talk of marching under the flag of Christ's wounds like the pilgrims back in 1536. In the Southwest, probably the most persistently rebellious corner of England, it went beyond encampments. There had already been disturbances in Cornwall in 1547 and 1548, including the lynching of a senior cleric. The rebellion there in 1549 is much more serious. The Cornish rebels focused not on the economic woes that were prominent in the rest of the country, but squarely on religious change. In 1536, the trigger had been the assault on the monasteries. This time, it was the new English Book of Common Prayer, which the rebels dismissed as a Christmas game, a parody of, the new, of true religion. They marched east, hoping to rally the region to their cause. But... They made it no further than Devon, and the support that they found even there was less than they hoped. The city of Exeter held out against them before it was relieved by a royal army, and the rebels were now pursued west, cornered and slaughtered, despite their attempts to surrender. Dozens of priests, the presumed fire starters of the rebellion, were killed in reprisals. So once again, a moment when popular will might have forced a change of direction, had come and gone. Because across most of the rest of England, the campers seem, if anything, to have aligned themselves not with the old religion, but with the new one. Protector Somerset's favorite preachers had spent two years touring the country, blaming the woes of the people on the greed of landowners and presenting their own moral crusade as a solution, a stance which may have may seem naive, but we do have to say it was sincerely meant. Now, whether the campers of 1549 really accepted those kinds of claims or just thought it was wise to adopt their ruler's cant, a great many of them did couch their economic complaints in the regime's own Protestant religious rhetoric. Protector Somerset pretended to listen to them. I mean, in truth, he was unable to do anything else. Um, most of the campers dispersed without serious incident as the summer wore on, being soothed by protests, by promises of listening from the centre. Only in Norfolk did a combination of some specific local woes and a ham-handed government response lead to serious violence, the incident known to history as Kett's Rebellion, 
which ended with a foreign mercenary army. Always good to use foreign mercenaries if you need to put down a rebellion amongst your own people. A foreign mercenary army slaughtering thousands at the Battle of Dussendale on the 27th of August, 1549. The political fallout from this summer of chaos was dramatic. Protector Somerset was blamed by those in the center of the regime for, for having led the country into chaos, and he's forced out of power. The government took on a steely new face. Its dominant figure was the man who had won the Battle of Dussendale against the Norfolk rebels, John Dudley, the Earl of Warwick. He soon elevated himself to the title which he's most remembered by, Duke of Northumberland. But once the dust was cleared from this autumn of furious political intrigue, it became clear that the one thing that this reconstituted regime was not going to change was its religious policy. That was still dominated by convinced Protestants, not least Archbishop Cranmer, but above all, the precocious young king himself. The ratchet of change only accelerated, further asset stripping, even extending to parishes communion silver, a new, more radical revision of the prayer book, a new set of 42 articles of religion, defining the English church's doctrines as unambiguously reformed Protestant, the tradition which would later be called Calvinist. So the rebellions of 1549, in the end, did the same thing that those of 1536 had done. A dangerous brush with popular opposition didn't weaken the reformers, it strengthened them. The political potency of religious traditionalism in England is at its lowest ever ebb during the final three or so years of Edward VI's reign. The remaining conservative churchmen are prized out of office and replaced with Protestant zealots. Their lay supporters are left mute and bewildered, many of them clinging to the fantasy that when the king grew up, he would be their good lord and restore true religion. These people, like our Kentish schoolmaster, John Proctor, had gone along with Henry VIII's reformation. They'd sworn to accept him as supreme head of the church. They would trusted that he and his heirs would be true to the faith that they hoped he shared with them. Now that trust was going septic on them. But what could they do apart from utter helpless prayers? And then, in the summer of 1553, those prayers were answered. Instead of growing up to be a Protestant tyrant, the 15-year-old king died of tuberculosis. He tried to fix the succession in favor of a young Protestant cousin who just so happened to be married to the Duke of Northumberland's son, but the plan was carried out too ineptly and it smelled too much of trickery to succeed. Instead, in the century's most successful rebellion, Henry VIII's cast off eldest daughter, Mary, swept to the throne. The wave of popular support that she rode to power reflected her perceived legitimacy, perhaps more than her religion, but it was still immediately obvious that England's 20 year heretical nightmare was over. The people who'd been cowed into collaboration by Henry VIII and bewildered into silence by Edward VI could now cheer. Perhaps they weren't actively demanding the full-scale return to papal obedience that followed, but they certainly accepted it. That much, at least, we can deduce from the effort and expense that people poured into to restoring their looted parish churches over the next five years, despite the continuing economic woes and latterly two devastating years of epidemics and near famine. Of course, their relief was short-lived. Queen Mary did quickly marry, but the royal pregnancy, which was announced and widely celebrated, turned out to be a mirage. When she died in 1558, she was as childless as her young brother had been. Unlike him, she was too wise or too cowardly to try to rig the succession. She accepted that the throne would pass to her Protestant half-sister, Elizabeth. The survivors of Edward VI's Protestant establishment now reassembled, it looked as if it was all going to begin again, as if nothing had changed. 
but that's not quite how things turned out. True, after a few months of delicate politicking, the new queen enacted a set of religious policies which broadly reset the dial to where it had been in the last year of King Edward's life. There was, once again, an English Book of Common Prayer enforced by another act of uniformity and another sweeping set of royal injunctions banning all the pieties and ornaments so painstakingly restored under Mary. There's almost a clean sweep of the bishops. Many of Elizabeth's newcomers were radicals who'd returned from years in exile, drinking at the wellsprings of Protestant purity in Switzerland and Germany. The restored monasteries were closed, only a handful of them anyway. Royal commissioners patiently went from church to church, purging them of so-called idolatry. The most obvious difference was that this time death didn't intervene. Elizabeth kept her so-called settlement of religion in place for almost 45 years, and her successor, James I, did no more than tweak it. England's religion wasn't only broken, but it was forcibly reset into a new shape and held there long enough that the bones knitted. But this bleak story of England's defamation isn't quite adequate. For one thing, as we'll see in the following lectures, by the start of Elizabeth's reign, it's becoming impossible to ignore the fact that England genuinely did have a mass Protestant movement. A small one, but nevertheless. For another, England's Ref Elizabeth's Reformation was not so much a restoration of her brothers than a kind of effigy of it. It didn't have the same relentless drive to uproot behind it. Her own idiosyncratic but stubborn affection for some of the old ways made its mark. It helped some of her traditionalist subjects to feel that they weren't entirely voiceless in this new world. Most importantly for those traditionalists, the world had been transformed by Mary's reign. She had failed to save Catholic England, but she had saved English Catholicism. The traditionalists who'd been paralyzed and impotent in the last years of Edward's reign were, under their new heretical monarch, energized and grimly ready. Elizabeth hoped to persuade a number of Mary's bishops to accept her new settlement. Men like Cuthbert Tunstall, the elderly Bishop of Durham, who had openly supported Henry's Reformation and who had tried for a while to work with Edward's. But Tunstall now refused to have anything to do with Elizabeth's settlement. And all but one of the other bishops joined him in this, the one exception being an undistinguished Welsh bishop whose reward was to be allowed to serve out the last four years of his life undisturbed. For almost everybody else, the battle lines were now clear. English Catholics, and we begin, can begin to use that term meaningfully, knew where they stood. They'd lost their taste for helpless conformity. Most of the stubborn Marian ex-bishops lived out their lives in Elizabeth's prisons. A younger generation of leaders chose exile, plotting their eventual return. They bombarded the new regime with printed polemics. They worked to, to drum up continent-wide support for their cause, the most obvious fruit of which was a new seminary for English Catholics established at Dowie in the Netherlands in 1568. But most of those who were now thinking of themselves as Catholics remained in England. Some chose to be recusants. This was a newly created legal category of, of defining those who defiantly refused to attend Protestant worship and had to pay a regular fine as a result. Others became so-called church papists, that is, papist at heart, but nevertheless attending the established church, cloaking their Catholic allegiance in a show of outward conformity. What no one knew was how strong these Catholic remnants were. For a decade, Elizabeth and her ministers sedulously avoided confronting or provoking them, they restricted themselves to carefully implementing the new settlement, progressively easing Catholics out of positions of influence 
slowly placing a new generation of clerics in the parishes. They hoped, the regime hoped, that time was on their side. And they feared that if 1536 or 1549 were repeated, they might not be lucky a third time. The phony war was brought to an end when a political crisis that had been simmering since the beginning of the reign boiled over. The crisis was the same crisis as it always was with the Tudors, the succession. Queen Elizabeth was unmarried and childless. Most of the serious candidates to succeed her, should she drop dead one day, and she was seriously ill in 1562, this was a real threat, most of the serious candidates to succeed her were Catholics. This made her reformation feel much less secure at the time than it looks to us in retrospect, especially because by far the most plausible of those Catholic candidates was her cousin, Mary, the Queen of Scots, who spent the 1560s trying to position herself as Elizabeth's natural successor. This effort is spectacularly unsuccessful, so much so that in 1567 it leads to Mary being deposed from her Scottish throne, and by 1568 it sees her imprisoned in England, suspected of having murdered her second husband. But no matter what prison she's in, as long as she breathed, she remained Elizabeth's likeliest heir. For Catholics, the prospect of a new queen who could reverse their fortunes at a stroke was too much to resist. In the autumn of 1569, amid a ferment of schemes and plots, two Catholic earls in England's northeast stumbled into rebellion, aiming to liberate the Scottish queen. Soon, most of the region was in arms. There were bonfires of Protestant prayer books, the Catholic mass, was celebrated in Durham Cathedral, and the earls prepared to march south. And once again, the threat evaporated. Too few men rallied to the earl's banner. Their hopes hinged on liberating the imprisoned Scottish queen, but she's whisked south long before they could reach her. A royal army is assembled with daunting speed, and it meets no real resistance. The Earl's small force ebbed away as they ran out of money, and they fled to Scotland, where the deposed Queen's enemies quickly did their best to curry favour with England by hunting the Earls down. England's Catholics evidently had spirit, but it was suddenly plain that they no longer had numbers. A second desperate rising in Cumberland was bloodily put down in February of 1570, And Elizabeth's soldiers now took full advantage of the weakness that had just been revealed in their opponents. What followed was a systematic punitive campaign of repression, which was without precedent in Tudor England. Suspects were tortured. Explicit quotas of between 20 and 40% were set by region for the proportion of suspects who should be executed and at least 600 were killed. There's scarcely even a pretense of individual justice. This is exemplary terror. And it worked. Catholic England would never rebel again. The survivors, both at home and abroad, faced two alternative paths. The first was laid out for them by Pope Pius V, who, in the wake of the Risings, issued a bull excommunicating England's heretical queen and calling on her subjects to rise up against her. In this defiant spirit, the seminary at Dowie and the others that that joined it were training English Catholic exiles and sending them back home as missionaries, stiffening spines, keeping underground networks alive, bringing the cutting edge of counter-Reformation Catholicism to England's shires. In 1579, a recently founded English college at Rome itself was taken over by the most formidable missionary order of the age, the Jesuits, who quickly made themselves the leaders of English Catholic resistance. This whole movement's message to ordinary Catholics in England was be resolute, shun conformity, wait, pray, and be ready. Meanwhile, the high command laid plans. 
Elizabeth might be assassinated. The Scottish Queen might be freed. The King of Spain's armada might transport a Catholic army to Kent and an army of English Catholics might rise up to join him. These hopes were not ridiculous. The regime took them immensely seriously. But realistic or not, the one thing that we know is that they came to nothing. At best, they helped England's Catholics to become a stubborn minority, cherishing their martyrs and holding on to the faith of their fathers for centuries to come. The cost was high. It was already plain that the Elizabethan state was perfectly ready to shed Catholic blood. The missionary priests met a storm of persecution. Henry VIII had executed dozens of papal loyalists, charging them with treason on the basis that they were recognizing a foreign prince, the Pope, over their own nat natural sovereign. But nobody died in this way between 1544 and 1573. Then a trickle of executions in the 70s turned into a flood in the 80s and 90s, nearly 200 in all. The fines for recusancy were ramped up to unpayable levels. Torture was again authorized. Simply to be a Catholic became, in effect, presumptive evidence of treason. So, seeing that that's where the first path led, it's no surprise that some English Catholics were tempted by the other way, to emphasize their loyalty to the queen, to try to find a way to practice their faith without declaring war on their country. The Jesuits staunchly opposed such compromises. And so by the late 1590s, the English mission is bitterly divided over this issue into pro and anti-Jesuit parties. And Elizabeth's regime naturally does everything it can deliberately to stir up trouble amongst these opposing groups. Rome eventually has to intervene to settle the dispute and the compromisers are the ones who get slapped down. As if to emphasize the point, in 1605, one group of very uncompromising Catholics nearly pulled off the most audacious plot of them all, to blow up the new King James I and his entire parliament with gunpowder. But it was the compromisers who had time on their side. There would be no more spectacular plots after this. And regular persecution came to an end too, King James's diplomatic opening to England's Catholic powers, and especially his son Charles I's marriage to a Catholic princess who was allowed to practice her faith at court. These things gave English Catholics friends in high places once again. There were spasms of bloody panic during the Civil War of the 1640s, during the exclusion crisis and the entirely imaginary popish plot of the 1670s, but aside from those feverishly paranoid moments, it slowly became clear that a kind of equilibrium had been reached. England's defamation was not going to be reversed by some political deus ex machina. But nor were England's Catholics going to be exterminated. They and their Protestant neighbors would have to work out a way of living together. To see how that could be made to happen, look at the Sussex town of Arundel. This was the realm of the Fitzalan family, the Earls of Arundel, who were staunchly loyal both to their Catholic religion and also to their Protestant monarchs. In the Middle Ages, the town's collegiate church had also housed in the same building the Fitzalan family's chapel. There'd been a simple iron gate built to separate the two parts of the building. When Henry VIII seized the collegiate church's assets in 1544, the Earl secured a unique coup. He managed to buy the part of the building that was the chapel back as his private property. And so from then until now, St. Nicholas's Church in Arundel has been an entity which is unique, but which is also a microcosm of the whole of England a divided church housing a frozen conflict. Most of the building is the Protestant, now rather the Anglican, parish church, where the monarch is still acknowledged as supreme governor. But on the other side of that gate, 
a gate that still stands, a gate that was never unlocked between 1544 and 1977, and has only been opened a handful of times since then. On the other side of the gate stands a Catholic chapel. Of course, for most of those centuries, this was illegal. But as long as the Fitzalans and their heirs, the Howards, pretended to conceal it, successive Protestant governments were willing to play along. The pretense that England was no longer a Catholic country was the same game played on a larger scale. In fact, Catholicism is built into the very architecture of post-Reformation England. To ignore the fact that only a gate separates the two takes a continuous effort of the will. Whether you see that gate as a disfiguring scar or as the kind of fence that makes for good neighbors, is up to you. But nothing would be more simple or more destabilizing than to swing it open. Thank you very much for being with me for this lecture today. Our next lecture in this series is at the beginning of February.